Hi everybody, welcome to Ebb on the Web and our online service. We're starting to think about Christmas today. So there's going to be something for all ages. There'll be uh, a Christmas song to listen to and some carols to sing together. And Ben Midgley is going to be preaching on the account of the wise men from the East coming to visit the Messiah. Children, Christmas is so exciting, isn't it? The food, the presents, the decorations. But did you know Christmas can be quite stressful for the grown-ups? It's very tiring going to the busy shops, buying all the presents, wrapping them up. Uh, it's very tiring going and getting all the food in, putting it away in the cupboards, then getting it out and cooking it and putting it out for everyone to eat. Then there's putting up all of the decorations. There's lots to do and lots to remember. And sometimes us grown-ups can get a bit stressed at Christmas time. We can get a little bit worried. Am I doing a good enough job? Is everyone going to be happy this Christmas time? Is my family happy? It can be stressful and we can feel under a lot of pressure. And sometimes during the Christmas holidays when all the families are together, we can start to think about the sad things in our lives. Uh, we can start to think about the people we miss. Christmas can be a time of struggling as well. But do you know what? If you feel like that, then you're not alone. Because even during the very first Christmas, all those thousands of years ago when the Lord Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph were so busy. They had so many worries, so many burdens. They had so many struggles going on inside. But the wonderful thing is the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was born into the middle of all of that. As followers of Jesus, we know a God who draws near to struggling people and who draws near to sinful people to save us and to rescue us from our sins and to reconcile us to God, to fix our relationship with him. He is the saviour of the world. And the Open the Book team are going to share with you now the story of Joseph. Not Joseph in the Old Testament with the colourful coat. No, Joseph the carpenter who married Mary, who gave birth to the Messiah, the King, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. I hope you enjoy this performance. There's a couple of actors in it from our church who I think deserve an Oscar. So enjoy. Joseph was a carpenter. Joseph was a very good carpenter. Whenever anyone wanted anything made, they would ask Joseph. Whenever anyone wanted anything mended, they would ask Joseph. Joseph was busy. Joseph was very busy. Joseph was engaged to Mary and he was busy earning money for their wedding day. Joseph was so busy working that when God sent an angel to give him a special message, the angel had to wait until Joseph was fast asleep before he would listen. Joseph, whispered the angel. Joseph, whispered the angel again. But Joseph was so tired from being so busy that the angel had to whisper into Joseph's dreams. Joseph, the angel whispered. Mary is going to have a baby. He is going to be a very special baby. He has been sent by God. You must marry Mary, and when the baby is born, you must give him the name of Jesus, the Saviour. Joseph was determined. Joseph was very determined. There was only one thing to do. 
he would marry Mary and look after her and God's special baby. And with added determination, Joseph went back to work making and mending, mending and making, busy earning money to look after Mary and God's special baby. Joseph was worried. Joseph was very worried. It was nearly time for Mary's baby to be born and the Romans had told everyone to return to their hometowns to be counted. Joseph and Mary would have to travel all the way to Bethlehem and Joseph was worried that the journey would be too long for Mary. Mary was busy. Mary was very busy. Mary was busy packing all the things that she and Joseph would need for the long journey. Food. Water. Hay for the donkey. Clothes for the new baby. So much to remember. So much to pack. Everyone was trying to get to Bethlehem. Everyone was trying to get to Bethlehem before it got dark. Everyone was trying to get to Bethlehem before all the rooms were taken. Mary was worried. Mary was very worried. It was nearly dark and they had only just arrived in Bethlehem. It was nearly time for her baby to be born and they had nowhere to stay. The innkeeper shook his head as he opened the door. Then he looked at Joseph and Mary and smiled. Follow me, he said and led them to a stable at the back of the inn. Joseph was happy. Joseph was very happy. As Joseph held Mary's tiny baby in his arms, he knew that this was a special baby. A special baby sent by God. And he gave him the name of Jesus, the Saviour. Children, how good was that acting? At times I felt like I was really there. Um, teenagers and young people, you are so valuable to God. He cares for you so much. And the evidence of God's care and God's love for you is not your circumstances. The evidence of his care and his love for you is Jesus. It's that baby lying in the manger born into this world for you. It's that baby who would grow up and ch exchange that manger for the wooden cross for you and his love for you. I know some of you are really looking forward to Christmas and I know some of you aren't. Uh, I thought I, I would encourage you by sharing with you a song that's really blessed me this week. It's by a big church in America called Sovereign Grace and it's called Oh Come All You Unfaithful. And to film the video for this Christmas song, they asked if there were any believers in their church who were going through a struggle, going through a hard season, whether they'd be willing to come and listen to the song and let them film their reaction as they meditated and reflected on the words of the song as it was sung to them. And so they filmed the video. Sovereign Grace are letting churches use their music videos for their online services. So I thought I'd share it with you now for your encouragement.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christ the Saviour was born for us, for ordinary, weak, anxious, fearful, struggling, sinful people like us. Father, thank you for giving us your precious, precious Son. We praise you for his birth, that the Word became flesh, that the Son of God took on a human nature, was born into our mess, was laid in that manger for us. Thank you that they called him Emmanuel, God with us in the darkness. Father, we praise you for his sinless life. Thank you for the way he didn't give in to sin. Where we have failed and given in, he resisted and succeeded. Thank you for his active righteousness. Thank you for the way he fulfilled the law for us. Thank you because of his life, perfect life, uninterrupted by sin, divine love, clothed in flesh. And we praise you and thank you that he went to the cross for us. This was his plan and his purpose, your plan and your purpose to rescue us. All of our sin was 
laid upon him. He faced the judgment we deserve for our sin. He bore it in his body so we can be forgiven and completely set free from guilt and from sin. And we thank you that by faith we are reconciled to you and have peace with you forever. We praise you for his resurrection, that he conquered and defeated death. And so we do not need to fear the future. We do not need to fear the end. He ascended and he was seated at your right hand and he has prepared a place for us. And he keeps us until that day when he welcomes us home. We don't know why we have to face the things we have to face in this fallen world, but we trust that you are with us. We trust that you care for us so much and that we are valuable to you. And we trust that you will lead us through and not let go of us. And so we pray, Father, forgive us for our many sins through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We bring to you our loving God, all our worries, all our burdens about Christmas and about the future. We cast them onto you and we simply pray, Lord, watch over us. Keep us in your tender care. Assure us more and more of your invincible love for us and your everlasting arms which surround us. And we pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus, the Saviour. Amen. Our Bible reading today is Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Save 
I'm sitting here in the church building um, amongst all these decorations. Uh, I brought that one in uh, from home, uh, partly because um, it relates to this uh, reading that that we've been looking at in the Gospel according to Matthew. Uh, I would have thought that some of these readings that traditionally come out at Christmas time are amongst the best known and best loved uh, readings into the common person in the street, as it were, uh, across the country. Um, And this particular narrative that we just read about these men uh, following a star would be known to to very, very many people. They're interested uh, in stars, aren't they? And they believe that somehow that that the stars have meaning and that if they can follow the star they can arrive at the thing to which this star is pointing and that their expectation is that they're going to meet a king. Now, stars are fascinating and these men were clearly absolutely absorbed in the study of the stars. It was a great passion, perhaps a lifelong passion for them. They may have been expert astrologers and astronomers as well. Uh, and, the, and the East, the Chaldean people were famous uh, for that practice, and the Margai were a, a Chaldean a tribe. But I don't think you have to go to Chaldea, which is present-day Iraq, to go and find expert astronomers and astrologists. Um, you probably go out into the high street, if you went into, uh, out to the market, and we, we stopped somebody, and we just said to them, <clears throat> tell me, are you, are you interested in stars? Um, y- now, obviously, that, that question might throw them a bit, and they may say, um, kind of, they, they might think you're driving a question about newsreaders who can dance, or, uh, you know, stars of the silver screen, celebrities, you know, and everybody's got a world of celebrities to which they look and turn and, and love and enjoy. Uh, maybe for, for you, it's an 18th century evangelist, I don't know, but different people have the celebrities, different celebrities, different stars that they love. But if we could clarify that we're not talking about um, uh, K-pop or something like that, that we're talking about the stars, we're talking about the celestial host, we're talking about the, the glories of, of the heavens above us, I think you'll find that a very, very large number of people love the stars. I can't think I've ever met anybody who doesn't. People stargaze, people, young children like looking up at the stars. Uh, old folks love looking up at the stars. Uh, when we're busy, it's, it's like a, a remedy uh, just to have a bit of time, maybe a summer, oh, summer, just think about that, summer, summer evening, shooting stars, uh, maybe eating out and, you know, the heavenly host above you on a clear night. It's wonderful, right? And I, I, perhaps some of you have been to far-flung places 
I remember being in the desert once and you could see stars that I never even, I'd never seen before. The sky was so clear. It was like star soup. Uh, wonderful, wonderful experiences. And on a winter's night too, I mean, not to decry winter because on a crisp, frosty, frosty uh, winter's night, you look up at the stars when it's clear. Oh, it's a beautiful, it's like crystal, it's like diamonds. Um, I know that's a bit corny, but I don't know how else to describe it. The stars are beautiful and people everywhere love the stars. And they don't just love the stars. Stars fill us with a sense of awe. We, we look up and often the first thing we say is, wow. You know, wow is a really interesting word. And I know it's fairly new to uh, our vocabulary, but essentially whether you use that word or something else, what you're expressing is a sense of wonder, a sense of awe that, that the world, the universe, the cosmos, life is vast, mysterious, glorious and uh, maybe at the same time we feel that we're very small possibly quite insignificant or, or, or very blessed and special at the same time there's something about stargazing it's not just they're not just beautiful they they fill us with a sense of wonder and more than that that wonder then has led people through through the centuries and around the world to gaze up at the stars and to study the stars study their their movements study the patterns give them names. The Bible says that, that God knows every star by name and we're sort of trying to catch up. You know, we've got, we've got our own names and the names of a lot of the, the stars come from the names of uh, the sort of gods that people worshipped in the past, the, the Greek and the Roman gods, Venus, Mercury, Mars, because there's a sense that these, these are have some weight, some significance about them. Uh, people, we're now sending these, we've been to the moon. I mean, remember, the sun is a star. It is the most glorious star. And for us, it's the most significant, the one around which we revolve. Perhaps the most fascinating star to us, the most important star to us. And there's huge amounts of study on the star. And we've been uh, on that star, on the sun. We've been to the moon. The Chinese have been up there putting a flag uh, this this week. And we want to go to Mars. Elon Musk is talking about getting us up to Mars. And there's so much sci-fi and films and fascination and science and astronomy. I gave Jake a book um, um, for his birthday about a nebula, which is the sort of in deep space, these incredible photographs um, taken from deep space of these these massive cloud clusters where new stars are coming into being. Um, absolutely fascinating. So there's a lot of science and interest and knowledge has come from it. And then for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, people have used the stars to guide them to know uh, the different seasons, the different times of year, the passing of time, and, and, and also out at sea or whatever, being able to navigate by the course of the stars. It's said that the Bedouin, some of the Bedouin, who are the, um, the Arabs who live in the deeper into the deserts and traverse the, the what look like the trackless waste of the desert with their camels, etc., or, or perhaps used to uh, more than they do today. Some of them can see the stars during the day and navigate their way across the desert, as well as those who've used them for navigation out at sea when there's no other landmark. The stars have given guidance to people. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that what these men that we read about in Matthew chapter 2 are doing is part of a, a wider thing that humanity does, which is look at the stars, wonder about the stars, uh, look for guidance from the stars, want to know more uh, what, what the significance of these things are. Now, if we're back in the supermarket now, and um, uh, I've grabbed this person, I've asked them, you know, do you like looking at the stars? And I'm saying, you know, once we've clarified about celebrities, it's interesting that we associate celebrities with the stars, as if somehow these people are like bright lights in our world against a backdrop of darkness. They, they guide us in some way, they inspire us, they fascinate us. We think they're beautiful or interesting and so on. But once we've clarified that question with them and we ask another question, how far into the Bible do you think you have to go before uh, we, we, we read about the stars? Because you think that the Bible, what is the Bible? If, if it's not a book that 
contains everything that is important to God uh, for us to know that he considers our important. Um, if this is the book that God has written, then and it's about the world and life and the meaning of life and, and so on, then you, you wonder how far into the book you'd find stars. And maybe they'd say, you know, I don't know, because there's 66 books in the Bible. Uh, is it in the first book or so on? Is it in the fifth? You know, how far in? And if it's in the first book, because it is in the first book, how far into that first book, Genesis, would you have to go before you met with the stars? The answer is that the stars appear on page one of the Bible. Page one of the Bible. Surely we'd have to recognize there must be some significance to the fact that the stars appear so, so early on uh, in the Bible. And in, in that first chapter, on that first page of the Bible, verses 16 and 17, if you want to look it up, book of Genesis, we're told something very important um, about the mystery of the stars and the wonder of the stars, that they have been placed there and, and made and put there by, by God. God made the stars. So that is a really significant thing to know. So there's this all-wise, all-knowing being, God, who has created all things. And it's being underlined and emphasized that amongst the creation, he made these glories above. In other words, he hasn't just made things down here above, below. He's made the whole universe, all of creation, all of these, all these uh, objects out in the, in the sun and the moon and, and so on and so forth. But then as we read on verse 17, not only are we told that God made the stars, and that's something we should know, so that there must be some wise purpose to the stars. We're then told why. Now, I'm not suggesting that every single reason for the stars is laid out there, but the, the, the primary thing God wants us to know about why he made the stars is there. And it basically falls into two categories. Category one so that we can measure out the time and the seasons. And we do, don't we? We revolve around the sun and that gives us a year. Uh, the moon goes through a rotation, that broadly gives us a month. Our own, we spin on an axis, exposing ourselves to the sun, that great star, the sun for half of the day, for half of our 24 hour rotation, for 12 hours, and that's what we call day. And the other half is night when we're not facing that star. So, so years go by, months go by, weeks go by, days go by, hours go by. Everything is ordered and organized by the sun and the stars. <coughs> and that's because they, they all give off light in the darkness. God doesn't, has not made the world to be dark. He hasn't made it to be disordered. He hasn't made it to be sort of uh, timeless. Um, there's a sense of moving through time that's given to us through, through the gift of the stars, actually. So that, that's something uh, worth, worth noting. And, and principally, it goes on to say, not just time, but to, to, that there should be light. God wants there to be light on the earth. He doesn't want us just left here, plunged into darkness, groping along uh, a wall in the dark all the time. But to, you know, to illuminate, even at night time, there should be stars, and the moon reflects the sun's light, and, and of course the glories of the sun during daylight. And everything prospers and lives because of the light of the sun, this great star that God has made. Um, there are some creatures on the earth that don't depend upon... The, the sun and the light uh, down at the bottom of the oceans, down in the mud, uh, living on thermal heat and uh, th thermal energy and um, some friction and so on for the, for the electric stimulation they need to live. But in the main, almost everything thrives and lives because of the sun and, and the light that we get from the stars. And yeah, so really, really important. God has... has given us these these things um, and of course it's natural light that is being referred to there and, and actual time and passing of seasons but there's also a met metaphorical sense that this is true as well like he doesn't want us to be like we we liken ignorance to darkness he doesn't want us to live in ignorance um, he wants us to have not the light of knowledge. He wants us to understand. He made the stars, so he stands behind these things that give us physical light because he wants us to have spiritual light. He wants us to have understanding. He wants us to have knowledge. He wants us to be wise. He wants us to know things. 
Um, he wants there to be order. He wants to organize and order our lives in a helpful and a sense of passing through this world in, in process and um, towards something, that we're going towards something. There's a direction to life as well. And, and actually, when you think about these things, you can learn that just from, 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 from the stars. Now, if, as we go through the Bible, uh, if we get to sort of, you know, we've just said that we're talking about the first chapter of the Bible there, the first page. But it's not far in, uh, by the time we get to chapter 15, for example, that we, we meet a man. Uh, and he's a wealthy man, a very successful man, really, in lots of ways. But what has happened is that all through his life, he's happily married, he loves his wife. Um, but there's a bit of a, he's in a really dark place because he's, he's getting very old. Uh, and as is his wife, and they've never been able to have children. So, number one, he hasn't been able to, he's got nobody he can pass on his physical wealth to. But number two, more important, he's got nobody to pass on what he's learned, what he knows, what he understands, his wisdom. And the, the greatest thing he's come to know in his life is that this is somebody who's come to know God. He believes in God and he's got no son or daughter to pass that knowledge on to in that sense. He's got other people around him, but they've got their other families and so on. Um, now he finds himself in this dark place and where does God point him to? He, he gets him looking up. He gets him looking up into the sky. He gets it. This is chapter 15 and looking at the stars. We, we meet him with God looking at the stars. And as he looks at the stars, God makes it clear to him that his fears, his, his, that dark place he's in, that sort of depressed place that he's in, his anxious place he's in, is completely ungrounded. He doesn't need to worry because he is going to have more, he's going to have as many children as there are the stars in the sky. Now, that, that doesn't mean he's, he himself in that generation, but his descendants, his children, his children's children. So he knows from this experience, from looking at the stars, this hope, this sense of promise returns, where he believes that God is going to guarantee that he will have a child and his children will have children and his children's children. And, and one day they will become so numerous, so many, like the stars in the sky, that he, his people will become, a, in fact, a nation, a, a, a mighty nation in their own right. And he comes away with that uh, real sense of promise. But there's something else about his children in that sense of promise. Because God showed him the, the stars, which give light and guidance and are beautiful and so on, it's not just the number of his future children that God is alluding to there or pointing him to, but also the quality of his children. They will be as a nation, as a people, they will bring light to the other nations. They'll bring guidance. They'll bring knowledge and wisdom and truth to the nation. He will, through his generations, will come blessing for the rest of the world. In a dark world, this family, as it grows, will bring light. There will be a, a light to the nations. Um, Later on, uh, many, many centuries later, somebody was reading that portion in um, uh, chapter 26 or thereabouts of Genesis and noting, and I'm sure it wasn't something that they were the first person to notice, that when God spoke to this man, Abraham, about his descendants through the stars, uh, he described how his children would be um, through his seed, through his seed uh, would, would be a blessing to all nations. And, and that there was a sense that they were going to be not just many, but one. And, and this writer, um, Paul, who wrote to a group of churches in, in a, a part of the country called Galatia, which is sort of in modern day Turkey today, this, this, uh, this, this thinker reflected on this thing and, and, and realized that God was pointing not just to each one of these future descendants being a source of blessing, but somehow that one of these um, descendants, one, one offspring that descended from Abraham would be, well, the light of the world, if I can put it like that. Um, and, and we understand what it is that there are so many, I don't, we can't count the stars, there are literally billions of stars. Um, but of all of the stars, the one, there is one star that is more important to us than all the others put together. Uh, 
And that's the sun, which we've talked about already. And in the same way, I suppose Paul, when he was reading back that bit of Genesis, he's saying that, yes, okay, it's referring to the descendants of Abraham, to the, the nation of Israel and all, all the children of Israel. But ultimately, it was a reference to one, one descendant, one great star, one star that shines more brightly, whose light is, has more consequence, more more life-giving, more knowledge and wisdom-giving than all the other stars put together. In the same way as the sun is the, far and away the most significant star uh, in, the, in the universe for us. And so this, this descendant would be the most, would be the, our great star, if I, could, I can put it like that. Um, so Abraham had, uh, he, he did have a son, and that was um, Isaac, and Isaac then had a son, that was Jacob, and Jacob had, ended up having 12 children, and, and one of them, his great-grandson, uh, was a bit of a dreamer, and some of you might have heard, he was quite a star in his own right, in fact, uh, um, Lloyd Webber and Andrew R Rice and Webber put together a musical about him, which was a big uh, box office hit in the West End and all around the world. Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and Jason Donovan was the star and all the rest of it. Well, any, anyway, Joseph, as you know from that, was a, a dreamer and he had this, this dream which, he, which God gave him and it was, it was of the stars. And in this dream, he saw uh, his star and the 11 stars representing his 11 brothers and the moon and the sun representing his parents, and all of those stars, including the sun and the moon, bowed down to his star. And clearly, in the same way as Paul had picked up on the sense that that promise that God gave Abraham, that one star would outshine the others, he was picking up and saying, I think God is saying that I am going to, in some way, outshine even my parents and my my brothers. It didn't go very down very well with his family, but it was God. And as you probably know, although he was a shepherd boy uh, living up in um, Judea at the time, he ended up being the prime minister of Egypt, which was the most powerful empire in the world. He was the, the, the number two man after Pharaoh. Um, and, and through him, through the way it all worked out, you can read about that in chapter 37 or thereabouts in Genesis. Um, the light of the knowledge of God came to the, to the Egyptian empire. They were facing great dangers and darkness and famines and so on. And God used um, Joseph like a star to guide the nation through those trials, to guide the Pharaoh through those trials to give wisdom to the nation to know how to prepare for the famine to come and to, to prosper despite the challenges they were facing and he, he remained prime minister there for 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 many many decades uh, like a bright shining star so in one sense the prophecy that sense of prophecy uh, came true and you could say well it all just rests there and, and that's where the book of Genesis ends with the Joseph the, the big star I suppose you go over, though, into the book of Numbers, which comes a little bit later, and we're about 400 years later, and Joseph has had children, and his brothers have had children, and now they are, as a nation, as many as the stars in the sky. So Israel has become a great nation, and it's time for them to leave Egypt and cross through the desert on their way up to the Promised Land, where they can have a land of their own and cities of their own and, and not live in Egypt any longer. And on the way there, which took them 40 years, uh, there was a, they had to pass through different people's lands and territory. And it was, a, it was a difficult and dark time for the nation. But this man, Balaam, was hired by some of Israel's enemies. And he was hired to basically curse Israel. And he, st he, he stood there uh, to pronounce uh, like uh, curses uh, over the nation. But as his mouth opened to curse Israel, uh, you can read this, I think it's chapter 24 of the book of Numbers. Um, out of his mouth came blessings. Because this man, who's called Balaam, he saw something. He saw rising out of Jacob, and Jacob was, is the other name for Israel. So this is a reference to the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. Out of Jacob, he saw a star was rising. 
And not only did he see a star, he saw that that star would have a scepter. Now, if you know what a scepter is, you know that it's something that kings have. Now, here's the thing. Joseph was a great star in his generation, the great star of his generation. But in this vision that Balaam had, he saw not a prime minister, a great prime minister, but a great king. So one even greater than Joseph, a kind of a descendant from those generations who would be greater even than the generations that had gone before. And Joseph up until then had been like the, the big star of, of, of Israel. But no, there's one coming who's going to be greater. And Balaam saw that, that there was another one who was coming who was going to be greater. So here, here's what I'm trying to say. God made the stars. First point, God made the stars. But he, he made them ultimately, the ultimate purpose for his making of the stars was to know that as we go through time and grow in knowledge and wisdom and understanding, we'll see that the stars are actually pointing to a king. That the stars in the sky have been used ultimately to point people to God and to his king. So that's the first thing. And so this is where we need to talk about celebrities for a minute, because if we're saying that the children of Abraham are likened to stars, that means that people are supposed to shine brightly like stars in the sky. We're supposed to guide people. We're supposed to point people. We're supposed to help and encourage and, and illuminate people around us. We have to be illuminated ourselves. We need light in order to shine ourselves. But it's not just shining for shining's sake. Like the thing about a celebrity is that they're bright and they're attractive and fascinating and interesting and all the rest of it. But if ultimately all they do is refer back to themselves and draw love and attention to themselves, they're not really fulfilling their purpose for which they've been made and not really using the, the gifts that God has given them. What people, you, me, celebrities, big people, small people, all sorts of people are supposed to do, like the stars, we're supposed to point forward to the king. Our lives, like the stars, are supposed to shine and the shining of, of our lives is supposed to illuminate and give wisdom and knowledge that points to this same king, this, this king, this star rising out of Jacob with this scepter in, 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 in his hand. Um, this king is going to be the light of the world and so all eyes should be there. This is this is the like the, as the sun is to the other stars. So this king is to all other people the most important person uh, that ever ever lived. So it's so important we don't worship stars, and that's why the whole star sign thing is just really a bit of a dead end, isn't it? We just end up sort of being guided in this sort of rather unhelpful way that refers back to ourselves. What we're supposed to be doing is not referring to ourselves and preoccupied with our own lives, but focusing and being preoccupied with the life of this great king. And that's the direction, the light that the, that the Bible gives us, um, uh, the, the wisdom that the Bible gives us. Stars are paralleled on earth amongst people who are supposed to shine, pointing to him. So look, I suppose that's the second point. If the first point that God made the stars to point to the king, then what we begin to realize is that in that we mirror the stars here on earth, we're supposed to point to the king too. That is what we're made for, to, to, to look to this, this all-important king. Now, I suppose this is what the, the Margai traveling were beginning to sort of catch on to, latch on to. As they looked at the stars and thought about some of these things, they began to realize that they were pointing to something. It was important they follow that point through. Because the thing about a sign is that if, if you drove into our town and there's a sign as you come into the town to, to give the name of the town, if you stopped your car there and said, right, we've arrived, well, you're basically just in a grass verge on the outskirts of the town. You've got to pass, you've got to see where the sign is pointing and follow that through to, to the town itself, to what it actually refers to. And, and so it's so important that the, as the stars point to this king, so we're supposed to point to this king, but we're not just, the, it's not the, the stars or us that are the ultimate object. We want to 
we want to see the king. And these, these Magi traveling, they wanted to see the king. Philippians uh, chapter 2, 14 and 15 tells us that Christians, people who have come to believe and know who this king is, are to be like stars shining in a darkened sky. That we're supposed to give guidance and light uh, to people. There should be a, a sort of a beauty about us uh, from our lives, our kindness, our, our graces, um, that, that make, attracts people to us, makes people look at us and think, what, what's that person got? What they point, where are they getting this light from? Where are they getting this knowledge, this wisdom from? Where's this all coming from? And we're saying, it's from the king. It's about the king. It's all about the king. And that's the great service that we can do in this world, is to point people uh, to him, which is what the angels have been made to do. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 tells us that the, the angels are likened to stars. Angels point to the king. The stars point point to the king we're supposed to point to the king too and that's what these wise men were doing they were beginning to turn their lives and and look for this king in search they're going in search of the king fallen angels fallen stars like like shooting stars you know people just self ref it's all about self pointing something less than pointing something um, ultimately uh, inferior to, to this great king. Well, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, we, we read it, uh, you've heard it read. Um, we see that these, these Magi, these men, have seen this star in the sky, this, this very particular star. And I love what they call the star. It's chapter 2 and verse 2. They say, where is the one who has been born king of the, king of the Jews? We saw his star. They knew that this, this very particular bright shining star was more important than all the other stars at that point. More important than the sun in a way because it was pointing them ultimately to the king. And they knew that that was the most important thing that they find this king and we read about that in chapter 2 verse 2 and wise men as they were they realized it wasn't enough just to, to know about the star or talk about the star they actually had to follow the star they had to follow up what they believed what they what they were being drawn to what they were interested in and follow it through to its proper conclusion uh, and we read about that in verse 9, where it says, After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen when it rose went ahead of them, and it stopped over the place where the child was. They followed the direction. What, what is this star pointing to? Uh, and that's what they were interested in. Not just the star, but what the star was referring to. How, what great joy when the star... Became, came to rest over the little town of Bethlehem. Because perhaps you don't know, just as this great star that we're referring to is one greater than Joseph, a son of Joseph, but the, this Bethlehem was the town of David, and David was Israel's first king. It, we call it the Star of David, don't we? That He was the first king to arise, a godly king to rise over Israel. And Yet there's another star coming who is greater, a son of David. So, wow, the star comes to rest over the town where David was born. This is the royal city. This is where kings are born. What a great excitement these wise men must have had when they found out that they were being led to a place where a king would be born, just as they hoped, just as they expected, that the star was pointing to a king. And there in the, in, the, in, the, in the place where they, the house, it says, where they um, arrived uh, in verse 9, it says, uh, until they stopped over the place where the child was and they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child. They saw the child. And, and seeing that child, they knew that this was the great star. A star has been born, a star has been born, like a nebula, which gives birth to stars out there in the universe. Here on earth, God's son, the one that all the way from the beginning of the Bible and all of creation has been pointed to and we're called to point to. Here he is, uh, the star, the star of creation. Um, 
has been born. And unsurprisingly, their response is that they worship him because they know that this is, this is God's son and, they, and God demands worship and they, they naturally, spontaneously uh, finding themselves uh, worshipping him. And the thing about God's son is that what's God's son going to do? God's son is going to rise up to point people as we look to him. He's going to point us to God, the God who made the stars. He's going to reconnect our relationship to the one who made the stars and sent him into the world for our sake so that our relationship with God just like Abraham just had this faith in God and each one of us who has faith in God we are the children of Abraham ultimately we are the stars the light of the world we're the ones who can point to this one this great star this Jesus who was born who brings us and points us back uh, to God so we talked about the beginning of the Bible. I need to wrap up. I'm sure time has, has passed. But um, interestingly, the last mention of stars, well, I wonder which part of the Bible. We hit back in the supermarket, back in the high street, I've grabbed somebody and said, okay, where, where do you think the first mention of the stars are in the Bible? And they've said, um, okay, I don't know, or whatever. And they said, but it's chapter one, page one. When's the last mention uh, of stars in the Bible. Well, perhaps you won't be too surprised to find out that it's in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And not just in the last, it's lots of stars actually in the book of Revelation. In fact, it's full of stars. It's a, it's, it's a book that's got probably more stars in it than any other book uh, in the Bible. And on, even on the very last page of the Bible and the first page of the Bible, we encounter stars. But now the star that is referred to in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 16. Let me just turn there. 22 and verse 16, right at the end of the Bible. Let me read to you what it says. 22 and verse 16. There's only a few verses left before the end of the book. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. We just talked about that and the bright morning star, the bright morning star. It's interesting, there is, Jesus is referring to himself as a star, the bright morning star. Morning star is an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because the morning star, we, we see some stars at the beginning of the night, as it starts to get dark, you see a few stars start to come out, don't they? And, and it increases as the time goes on, it gets brighter and brighter. The morning star is the last of all the stars. It, it, it sort of appears almost before dawn, before the sun itself appears. And in referring to himself as a bright morning star, he's saying that there's been so many stars that have gone before me, but I'm the one, the, the, the end of time, the one, the, the one that's all been pointing towards, the one, the, the final star, the most important, the, the last of the stars. And, and the one to which the whole Bible has been pointing us to, and the heavens point us to, and the angels point us to, and men who know God point us to, and wise men point us to. Jesus, the bright morning star. Um, and after him, what else is there? But the sun comes up, the glory of God. And, uh, and that's really all there is beyond um, Jesus is to, to know God and to enter into his the, the day of the Lord if I can uh, put it like that there it is at the end of the Bible but there was a man by the name of Peter you probably heard of him like Paul he was an apostle and a writer and he talks about the whole experience of of coming to believe that Jesus is that king to which the stars and the prophets and the angels and godly men have pointed, um, wise men have pointed. And he said, it's, it's a work of God's Holy Spirit. And it's as if the, the, the morning star has arisen in your hearts. It, you can find that reference, if you like, in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. It's like a, a, an inward moment when the star appears, that, that final realization, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And going back to the book of Revelations again in chapter 2, verses 28, there's a, there's a sense of real promise 
that it's the greatest gift that a person can ever receive, really, is to the realisation that Jesus is God's King. Jesus is God's Son. And the whole universe, the whole of creation, the whole of our lives is, has been built and designed to know and see and love and worship God through him. That's, that's what life's all about. That's the meaning of life. That is the wisdom. That's the truth. That's the light. Uh, and Jesus is the light of the world. God, that's my final point really, God has given us Jesus to be our king. And that is the happiest and the best news you're ever going to hear. And may the, 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 the morning star rise in your hearts. Uh, and may that light uh, fill your life uh, with joy both now, over this Christmas season, and for the rest of your days. May it be guidance and light to you. Because I love the stars and they're beautiful. And they fill me with awe and wonder. They are fascinating and intriguing, but they're only a dim reflection of Jesus, who is so much more beautiful and so much more, fills my life with so much more awe and wonder. He's more fascinating, more, more intriguing uh, than the, the whole universe put together. He is God, manifest here on earth, the Son of God. Worship him. Worship Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love